All right, and welcome back to the Mental Health Toolbox. I am Patrick Martin, your host, and in this episode, we'll be covering social support and more specifically, how to improve your social support system or increase your existing social support. And in this episode, I'll be covering the types of social support to consider, how to map out your social support, and we'll be covering two different methods on that, how to figure out where to start if you're not sure, uh, right? And then also how to get the most out of your existing social support system and how to build your social support network. All right. So stick with us and I hope you find some value out of this. If you do, be sure to subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like it and uh, share it. And if you're on the podcast, definitely um, also share it if you find it helpful and be sure to subscribe and leave, re- leave a review on Apple iTunes if you can. All right. So let's get into it. All right, me and my uh, sipping on my green tea keeps me uh, in a good state. All right, so what social support is and what it is not, I think we should probably start off with this question. I think it's important to first consider um, what we mean when we say social support because it's not always clear. And to give you an example, when I'm working with clients as a, as a therapist in that regard, um, one of the first things I invariably ask them is, where do you get your support from? And almost always I get a response from the person stating uh, who they're dependent on, right? In the event they are not independent. And so I find myself providing routine psychoeducation around the difference between environmental support and social support or rather moral support, if you want to think about it in those terms. And social support is the branch of support that nourishes personal development. And it's how I, I like to think about it. It is the support that we uh, voluntarily elicit from others. It's not out of necessity, but rather out of desire and genuinely connect with other human beings in our venture to be understood. All right. So the the first thing I want to mention then is the difference between what so you know dependence and social support as a moral support. And so when and th- when I'm talking about how to build your social support network, I'm really talking about how to leverage and build upon moral supports, right? Supports of your choosing. And so to get, dive a little deeper in in what the definition of social social support is. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and read to you a definition from Wikipedia. And Wikipedia, I'll just read it for you, defines social support as the perception and actuality that one is cared for, has assistance available from other people, and most popularly, that one is part of a social support network. These supportive resources can be either emotional, such as nurturance, informational, advice, or companionship, a sense of belonging, even tangible, like financial assistance, or intangible, like personal advice. And social support can be measured by the perception that one has assistance available, the actual received assistance, or the degree to which a person is integrated in a social support network. Support can come from many sources, such as family, friends, pets, neighbors, coworkers, organizations, right? And so you see, it's not enough to have a social support network available. One must perceive or more specifically acknowledge and accept that support and intentionally adopt and integrate it into their life. It is really the proactive measure to elicit support from other people and then also participate and reciprocate in it, right? So we get support from lots of not just people, but things around us. For example, I get a lot of, you know, support from my cat. It's kind of a love-hate relationship, right? Most, mostly love. But, um, you know, my cat gives lots of support. It doesn't mean that she um, is, she's more of a taker, right? Cats are. But there's something about pets that we are able to elicit support from and usually it's just kind of a passive support you know uh, of acceptance or unconditional love right maybe more from dogs than cats i think you have to work a little more for a cat's attention but uh, my cat nala 
you know, has been with me since she, she was a rescue of a kitten. Uh, and now she's about seven years old in human years. So uh, still around, still uh, providing lots of support to me and my family, my kids. Um, another type of support is nature, right? Uh, you know, go to the beach, the ocean waves, just watching the, the power and magnificent, you know, magnificence of nature and its ability to just, you know, help us feel grounded. And that is definitely a type of support. But when we're looking at support in the, in the lens of what we're talking about here in this episode, it's really about being proactive and teasing out and trying to engineer our quality of life around support systems that build us up. And we'll dive a little bit more into that here. And as mentioned, it's it's more than just having an, a support network available. We have to perceive that it's there. As mentioned in that definition in Wikipedia, we have to be able to identify not just that one is available, right? But we have to, it's not just the fact that one is available, but we have to actually acknowledge that it's there before we can act upon it and elicit support from it. That makes sense? So furthermore, as mentioned in the above definition, social support comes in many shapes and sizes, and the better we become at identifying social support in its many facets, the more promptly we will be able to get our needs met, right? Our emotional needs and our physical needs. And uh, once those needs are realized, so we have to identify what our needs are, and then we have to identify how to match those needs in our support network or system. And we'll dive more into that. And that's really what this episode is about is how to get more into the tangible and tactical methods for making that happen. Okay. And uh, the very types of social support work in concert together, you know, to form what we call our support network. Um, And to kind of drill in this idea The Merriam-Webster defines a social support network as a network of people who provide an individual with practical or emotional support. So you see, indeed, social support can be pragmatic or strictly validation. And unless we know what kind of support we need in a given moment, we usually gravitate towards the support that's most accessible to us, but not necessarily the support that's most advantageous. And this can leave us feeling misunderstood and often frustrated. Uh, And the reason behind that is because we're not utilizing the most appropriate support to meet our need, and that oftentimes leaves us feeling um, empty-handed or unfulfilled. And it's not because we didn't necessarily have the right support. It's just that we didn't know where to look or who to leverage in that context, right? Um, And so on that note, I want you to consider three types of social support, okay? And while there are many categories of social support, there are in general three main types of social support, which are as follows. The first being active. So active supports consist of the types of people and environments and groups that act as a force that propels us toward our stated goals and ambitions. They hold us accountable to our values and keep us just outside our comfort zone and really in our growth zone, right? We think about our, you know, uh, James Clear talks about this in his book, uh, Atomic Habits. You know, there's lots, lots of work around this concept that we have to be uncomfortable to grow and active supports really push us in that direction. Okay. Um, For me, you know, I think of iron sharpening iron. You may have heard of that phrase before, iron sharpens iron. And being a Christian, it was not uh, just kind of in a little background. It wasn't uncommon in my church as a teenager for people to ask me what was my life verse, right? It was pretty pretty common in the Christian realm to have a life verse. And in my youth, I never really could pinpoint what uh, one verse was that defined me. In fact, it was not until I became engaged to my now wife that a verse really just kind of jumped out at me that made sense. 
and in the most concise way. And as I considered my proposal, the passage Proverbs 27, 17 came to mind, which states, As iron sharpens iron, so one sharpens the countenance of his friend. That's the New King, New King James Version. But really that is to say that in relationships, the goal and the purpose is to build one another up, right? To be invested in the personal development of the other. And this was really so poignant for me that it's actually, I'll show you, I don't know if you can really see it, but it's engraved in, um, can't really see it, but it's actually engraved inside of my ring as a constant reminder to me that my role as a spouse is to not just take, but to give, but give in a way that builds the other person up. I remember when I was getting married that the... um, the pastor, the officiator had said, don't lose your individuality. And I think that is such an important thing because the longer you're with somebody, the easier it is to kind of blend into each other and you maybe stop challenging each other as much. Um, But it's important that when we're thinking about being an active support for another person and who's more important than your spouse, right? Is um, whether you're a parent or a spouse Uh, Whatever your role is, you know, in a relationship, the challenge to me is always to build the other person up, to challenge the other person. It's easy to forget that, Um, hence it being engraved in my ring, right? It's a reminder to be that person, to know what my role is in my marriage. But it's the same in any relationship, really. The goal is to build the other person up. And if this is a, a reciprocal thing, as it should be, then both parties are winning in that regard. It's not always fun to be challenged, but it's that growth is what causes growth, right? And if we're not growing, really, what are we doing? Um, So active social supports really build up, encourage, and challenge other people. They're not afraid of offending. And if done with the best intentions, usually there is no offense. And it listens without judgment, and it's in good, you know, the idea is to be a good sounding board. And good supports care about your outcomes. They believe in your potential and they seek understanding versus blame. All right. So those are active supports, you know. Um, and so if you're ever asking yourself, you know, I have any active supports in my life, these are the, really the traits that you're looking for. All right. The, the green flags, if you would. Now, the next. What, the next one of the three is passive supports. And a passive social support really differs from active, support, active supports in that they are usually well-meaning, but they're not invested and likely lack insight into your actual pain points. This is not because they are disinterested, but rather that they have their own time constraints and other commitments. So why do some people rely so heavily on passive supports as opposed to investing most of their time in active supports? Um, It's usually because of convenience, actually. Um, Something I think of as the proximity rule. You see, people do what they know, and they will reach out to those in times of need who are both most familiar and within their general vicinity. The problem with this, of course, as you might guess, is that those supports may not be best adapted to attend to your particular need, uh, crisis, or concern, right? Meaning that they might be convenient, but maybe not the most advantageous support given your options, is what I'm saying. Now, if they're your only option, and if they're your option over a, a, a bad influence, then of course, by all means, go to your passive supports. But the, really the whole goal of this discussion is to increase the amount of active supports you have at your disposal, right? <clears throat> okay. So the third, of course, as you might have guessed, is damaging supports, right? And while damaging support types may be a good deal more obvious it sadly does not mean that they are easy to quit. You see, just like people are likely to turn to passive supports over seeking active supports uh, due to the proximity rule, like we just discussed, 
If damaging supports are the most familiar, the convenience of that familiarity will often trump the unknown, which is often plagued with its own fears, right? Nobody likes to change, right? And, you know, the thing is, everybody usually loves change when it's good change, but they love the outcomes, right? The aftermath of change, but nobody likes the growing pains of changing their their lifestyle, their circumstances, their friend groups, because there's a lot of unknown, right? And unknown makes people uncomfortable. And you see, uh, you know if there's damaging supports, and these are some of the red flags I just want to kind of point out to you. Damaging social support groups are ones that disregard risk factors that impact you. They tempt you into harmful choices. Remember that saying, misery loves company? And they are often manipulative, self-serving, and often outright abusive. They are dismissive toward your feelings and make you a scapegoat, project their own insecurities onto you, discourage you from your goals, your success makes them feel threatened, and they also minimize the importance of your personal development, also because it makes them feel threatened. Damaging social supports are ones that not only keep you in your comfort zone, they encourage the compelling and compiling of problems to an already compact list of unaddressed issues that stunt your personal development and realization of your goals. So they chain you to your comfort zone. Does that make sense? They make it very hard and uncomfortable to leave. So that brings us, you know, into mapping our social support system. This is the next thing I want to address with you. So we've already discussed, you know, what active social supports are, what passive social supports are, and damaging supports. And we've discussed that being a good, you know, a healthy social support does not mean it's different than dependence, right? My, my wife is on a kick right now about rescuing monarch butterflies and she's turning our uh, property into a butterfly way station, which is awesome, which basically means that we get to be certified as a haven for the monarch butterfly. And that translates to having lots of milkweed and other, other plants that they uh, are accustomed to and can only actually eat and uh, reproduce on. So it's pretty cool. And she has these net bags that she carries around, and um, she rescues the eggs, and then the eggs hatch, and they turn into monarch caterpillars, and she puts the milkweed plants in there. And I'll, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube video, I'll put it up on the screen so you can see what I'm talking about. But that is very much a dependent relationship. The caterpillars are dependent on her to make sure that they are safe from predators and other um, toxins and things that would interfere with their metamorphosis, right, in the chrysalis. And so she tries to see them from birth to transition into butterflies. And, you know, she can't always prevent things from happening, but that's a very dependent relationship. But she's also a very active support. But it the, it's not really, you know, it's not an equal playing field. And so when we think about active supports, I just want to mention, you know, because it is something that we elicit, whereas dependent relationships tend to be things that are kind of forced upon us for our own good. And the goal here is to increase our active supports, right, in our support system. All right. So how do we map out our social support system? And really, there are two methods that I'll touch on, the first of which is the interpersonal circle. You may or may not have heard about this, um, but it is derived, at least um, on my end, from uh, interpersonal psychotherapy. And I was actually trained by the creator of interpersonal psychotherapy. This is the little handbook here. Um by Dr. Stuart Schultz. Uh, I attended his training for certification to provide it, but the concept is rather simple, and we'll talk about that here. Um, and basically, the whole idea with the interpersonal circle, I don't think it's exclusive to interpersonal psychotherapy. I could be wrong. But the idea, and this is just one piece of it, is that you're looking at your support system from 
a bird's eye view. So you'll, if you apologize, I, uh, I apologize for my imperfect circles. Um, but if you'll see here, it's basically like a target, right? You look like the other target sign, you have three rings. And the idea is that we are at the center, right? We're at the center and each ring represents another level of intimacy. And so oftentimes when I'm thinking about support system where I'm working with clients and counseling and I'm trying to help them, I'm trying to get a bird's eye view, but I'm also trying to help them see that relationships and support networks are not fixed, meaning they actually get to choose, right? To some extent, what their support system looks like. And so, for example, the if let's just say, you know, I'll have them plug in people at different, you know, areas of intimacy. And we'll just say John, Jill, and Jane, right? And you'll see here that maybe Jane is closer to the center, which means it's a more intimate relationship. And then Jill is somewhere in the middle, and John is way out here. And then you would maybe define the nature of the relationship. Maybe John is your brother, even could be family, friends. And then Jill is your classmate. I'm just, you know, spitball in here, but, and then let's just say Jane is your friend since elementary school, whatever. And then I would ask, you know, is this the way you want it to look? Do you want your support system to look this way? And if not, what would you like to look different? Do you, would you like to see more names around your support system? Would you like to see people at a different level of intimacy? And so that's, that's where the fun is, is you really get to kind of think about what makes up your support system. And then ideally, if you could shift things around, what that would look like. So in that event, I would have you draw an arrow, for example, if you thought, oh, Jane, you know, she takes up a lot of my personal time. We're not, you know, I really, you know, would rather Jill be closer, you know, be closer to Jill, maybe not spend as much time with Jane. You could just draw an arrow pointing outward from Jane and then an arrow drawing inward from Jill, kind of like that. And then it gives you an idea of what you have to work with. And maybe you're okay with John being where he is. You just write a little okay next to John, right? Out there. And the whole idea here, and you can see it can get rather complex as you drop all the names in here of people that you have regular interaction with. Um, that you have a lot to work with, more than maybe you, you realize. And it's actually pretty fun when you start to see how much control and power you actually have in your support system. At least I think so. And um, so it's a great place to start. And so really the interpersonal circle is about getting that bird's eye view so that you see what you're working with. And um, the other thing is, you know, you might want to change a lot of things, but not every relationship holds the same potential for change, right? So you could aim for low hanging fruit in that regard and say, okay, so which relationship is the most receptive? Who's most receptive when I when I text or when I call? Um, and who's most likely to, to reciprocate? And so then you can start to kind of single those people out in your support system and say, oh, okay, I could do a couple things different. I could try calling so-and-so more often and reach out and try and uh, put more energy into that relationship and see if I get any movement as opposed to or relate somebody that's maybe busier or doesn't respond as much. And you know who those people are, right? So the fun thing about this is you can start to prioritize who you want to focus on and why and when, and, and then put it into action. Say, how am I going to do this? How am I going to reach out to this person? What, what do I expect to happen? And um, if they don't respond, who's next on my list? So you can just go through it very systematically that way. Okay. All right. Still with me? Good, good. So we just talked about the interpersonal circle, right? And so now the other method for mapping our support system is quadrants. So instead of a bird's eye view, we're actually looking at our support system in quadrants or domains, if you would. And this one, um, you know, it doesn't have to be four domains, you know, it could be eight, could be 16, whatever makes sense to you. But the idea with, um, quadrants or domains is that we understand that every relationship is 
a two-way street, right? We're giving support and we're receiving support. But if you're more of a list person, this might be uh, more to your liking. So if you just think about your support system, we'll just do four squares for simplicity, okay? So if you have four squares, like a little, make yourself a little graph there, um, then you would think of four categories of support. Um, common ones would be, I don't know, spiritual, emotional, health, personal development, and practical, right? Logical. Okay, so then once you have uh, four general domains for your supports, then what you would do is you would just start listing names under each one. When you think of your spiritual support, who comes to mind, right? If you're a person, you know, Christian Catholic could be pastor, priest, um, could be, uh, if you're not religious, it could be uh, someone you look up to, uh, could be nature, right? Um, whatever, you know, if you meditate, you know, if there's uh, a role model you look up to, you know, whatever you connect with on the spiritual level would be maybe people that fall under that. Or if you have somebody within your spiritual network that is a more of a mentor to you, then you could list those people. Um, could be your 12-step group, right? Where do you get your spiritual support from? And if you don't like the word spiritual, you can replace that with anything else that makes sense, recovery or something like that. Okay. Same thing with emotional. You know, you all, you know, we all have those friends who, you know, provide more emotional validation than they do good advice, right? That are a good shoulder to cry on, that are receptive. Um, but really, when it comes to actionable information, they're maybe not the best source. Um, but maybe we do have those friends who are very good with shooting from the hip and being very direct with us and telling us what we, you know, ought to do under the circumstances, and it's very logical and practical, but you don't get a whole, whole lot of warm fuzzies from them, right? Um, and then maybe your your supports that would fall, fall under health would be your gym coach, your trainer, your gym buddy, your friend that goes on the walks with you, or the jogs, or um, your Zumba class friends, you know, or um, it could be somebody you don't personally know, but somebody you follow on YouTube, even. Um, I'm into juicing, you know, and I used to watch Drew Canoli with Fit Life TV and um, I was really into him and his Saturday strategies and, you know, biohacks and that kind of stuff. I'm really big on biohacks and, and, and ways to maximize in my diet and paying for your buck kind of stuff. So for me, you know, I could think of people I know personally. I could also think of um, companies like NutriShop. I love NutriShop. I, I, like going there and talking to the manager and asking, you know, does it, how does, you know, is this a good supplement for this or that? And it's really kind of neat. And they have the smart scale there that measures your body fat percentage and your visceral fat and your muscle mass and your skeletal mass and all that good stuff and how much water you're retaining, how much, you know, if you're dehydrated, it's pretty fascinating stuff. But when I think about health and fitness, you know, I can off the top of my head, think about the people and places where I get inspiration and motivation. And that's what I'm talking about. But you don't really give back to a YouTube entity, right? Um, but if it's somebody that works out with you, you can support that person back in another way. And so as you're looking at your grid, you know, whatever names fall under there, I want you to ask yourself a couple questions. I want you to consider who do I get support from and who do I give support to? Okay. And the other thing I want you to consider is if there's any, if you notice that, you know, as, as you probably will, maybe you have a lot of supports in one domain, but not very many in another. That's a good indication that you're neglecting that part of your life. And that's a good place to start focusing. All right. And it's perfectly normal also that you'll see a crossover that you see the same name in more than one domain. That's normal too. But I want, you know, another takeaway from this that I want you to have is that if you need a shoulder to cry on, 
that maybe you don't go to the person who is a practical support just because of that proximity rule that we were talking about. That just because that person happens to be easy to access because they live under the same roof or you're used to talking to them or you run into them more often, that maybe they're, if they're not best suited for your need, if you need to vent and a shoulder to cry on, if even if it's a little more work, it's, you're probably better off calling that other friend who you know will just give give you non-judgmental positive regard, right? Because sometimes if you just need a shoulder to cry on and you go to the logical person who wants to, you know, give you all the facts and what to do, it can feel very invalidating and even judgmental sometimes. And so that's why this topic is so important. And it's one of probably the main topics I encounter with, you know, when working with clients and counseling is just how to be more savvy about your support system, because that has a direct correlation to your quality of life and your level of satisfaction in life. Okay. So, you know, those are the two methods. So I'll put that away for now. Okay. So, okay. Once you've mapped out your social support system, you're probably wondering, okay, so where do I start? And um, I'll go through that with you right now. There's five areas that really you should consider and five, I guess, points that you want to consider when you're trying to figure out where to start and, and reframing, building your support system. Okay. Okay. So point number one, make room. All right. By this, I mean, eliminate damaging social supports and minimize passive social supports. All right. So eliminate, you know, cut the damaging supports. That's a no brainer, right? You know what those are, those toxic relationships, the ones that are holding you back and keeping you down from working on your, your goals, right? But minimizing positive supports, that's a little more tricky. But the whole idea with that is to make room. It might not feel natural, but if all of your time is going into passive supports, they feel good, but they're not really moving the needle with you. Not that other people, it's not their job to motivate you, but it's important to make sure that you're making enough room for the active supports in your life, or at least to create room for opportunity there, okay? The second thing I want you to consider is destination and origin, okay? So by that I mean, in order to set goals, we first need to figure out what we are starting with. That's why it's important to map out your social support system as it is now, in real time, a snapshot. It can be uncomfortable, and even triggering, right? When you start thinking about our relationships, that's usually the most triggering thing. But it is vital to talk talk about it and to take stock of what we are working with before we set goals. And once you have a good idea of where you are, how you got here, how I got here, then we can start to postulate potential goals. Not rigid expectations, but goals that lead to and frame the quality of life that you want and aspire to. Fair enough. The next thing is needs assessment. So this is the third point, a needs assessment. You need a good place to start that is simply, you know, listing out the things that you feel are lacking in your life, right? Right now. So listing out the things that you feel are lacking in your life and the things that occupy your mental energy around discontent, the things you ruminate on. These are often the pragmatic hurdles in your life, in my life, concerning such things as finances, relationship stress, housing, employment, health and fitness, and weight loss goals, right? All right. And the fourth thing is low-hanging fruit. So once you have conducted a needs assessment, then you want to focus on the mini goals within striking distance. Then research and identify the types of support that are best suited for helping you to execute on those goals with actionable advice, right? Things that really move the needle. So low-hanging fruit, 
right? The obvious stuff. And once you've done the needs assessment and the social support mapping, it'll be a lot more obvious to you where the gaps are, right? Like I said, on the grid, you know, if you notice that you're one, you know, one of your life domains is way out of balance with others. That's a strong indication of a place to start, right? Um, or if you're doing the interpersonal circle, it's a lot easier to figure out who's going to reciprocate the most in terms of rearranging the levels of intimacy in terms of where you're putting your time. All right. The fifth point here of where to start and the last one is past success of healthy relationships, right? You've heard that phrase, success leaves clues. Well, this is true in your relationships. Think about the last time you were pleased with your quality of life in any capacity and then ask yourself, what did my social, social support system look like at that time? While no exact circumstance is the same, we can benefit from <clears throat> reflecting on what has been helpful in the past and see if we can repeat those life rhythms and systems in our current context, right? Life is a series of rhythms and patterns that get disrupted with change because change is a constant. And if we can reflect on what's worked in the past, we can reintegrate a lot of those rhythms back into our life with just a different, different clothes on, right? A different, different context. All right, moving on. How do you get the most out of your existing support system? Okay, something uh, to consider here. How do we maximize what we already have? We've been talking about how do we add to or rearrange what we have, but it's also important to consider how do we just leverage what is already in place, all right? And on that, I have nine points I want to run by you. The first of which is to be more intentional with your time. To budget the time... Budget your time like you would your money, thinking ahead about how to prioritize the main things and focusing on quality over quantity, all right? Quality over quantity. So just being more mindful of how you're budgeting your time. The second thing is the interpersonal circle, which we've talked about. Mapping out your support system as it is now from a bird's eye view and then focus on what you would like to see different and start taking proactive steps. And these steps are about how you're going to direct the flow and intimacy of your current support system to that end, okay? The third thing is to prime your supports. So educate those in your support system. Tell them how to help you best. They don't know. Most people don't know how to help you, and that makes them very uncomfortable because When you come to them, they're just going to do what comes naturally, but that's probably not what we always need. People appreciate knowing their role in your life, and people generally will do and want to know how they can be supportive versus having to just guess, right? Guess what you need in the moment. Do you need a shoulder to cry on or do you want advice? People don't always know, so they're just going to do what feels natural or the first thing that's top of mind to them. The fourth point is to be direct. In his book, Dare to Lead, Brene Brown states, to be clear is to be kind. This is so true, and it's a principle that has echoed throughout many other works on self-improvement, especially in the area of relationships. You see, boundaries are about helping others help you to show up as your best self. I'll say that again. Boundaries are about helping others to help you show up as your best self. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. That's a verse that's always stuck with me from Matthew 5.37. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Okay, boundaries. All right. And to know your negotiables. This is point five. Know your negotiables and your non-negotiables, right? Boundaries. I will always remember this phrase, you know, non-negotiables from my uh, 
my old pastor, my youth pastor, big mentor in my life. And uh, he just imparted a lot of wisdom. But this is one that has always stuck with me. Know your non-negotiables. So really you're talking about boundaries, right? Know your boundaries. And uh, a very well-known author around boundaries to this point is uh, Dr. Henry Cloud. He has created quite the collection of books on the subject alone, just on boundaries, that are worth adding to your library. They're easy reads, small books. And in order to level up your skills around securing and maintaining strong social support systems by way of boundary setting. Okay? Dr. Henry Cloud. Communicate. So this has to do with interpersonal skills. I could and likely will create an entire series on this topic alone. I've already created some videos on it. Um, If you'd like to learn more about interpersonal skills, be sure to check out my previous episode on the subject. Um, You can get that in the show notes description. Okay. Um, But communication, right? Point number seven, reciprocate. All right. So by this, I mean, show a genuine interest in others, right? And express validation to others, just like you like to be validated. And most importantly, I don't think this is talked about enough, but be of service. Be of service. One of the best ways to get out of your own head is to be of service. It's probably the most grounding thing there is, right? To be of service to other people with no personal agenda right? Very powerful. Number eight, know your triggers, right? Know what sets you off, right? And then try to anticipate ways to mitigate those, right? How do you not step on the minds, right? So if you know where they are, it's easier to kind of work your way around them in social situations. That's all I'll say about that. Um, And then number nine, plan ahead for safe coping. Know what works, and working with clients, I often have, have them fill out mood scales. Um, the whole purpose behind that is to find out what's working. What's working and what's not working. When you're having a crappy day, how did you cope? When you're having a good day, how did you cope? What coping skills are working? And we don't always see the, the patterns. We don't always connect the dots. And so um, plan for safe coping. But in order to do that, you have to know what works. All right. So um, I would just like to take some time to touch, uh, and we're almost done, but I just want to touch on a few things in terms of tools. I'm a very tangible guy. I like actionable information and resources. And so I'm just going to share a few with you. Um, These are some tools on how to build your support network. Okay. There's five tools that come to mind. The first of which is meetup.com. No, it's not a dating site. I talk about Meetup a lot. Meetup.com is a social interest site. So if you like book clubs, guess what? You can find some local book clubs. If you like hiking, guess what? There's local hiking groups. Um, I'm in the LA area. LA Hikers is like 40,000 members and growing. Um, But if you want to find something small in your city, let's say you like cycling, you can find a cycling group. Awesome, right? There's a group for everything. Board game group writers group, you name it. There's even a, a, you know, I create my own website and and manage it. And there's even WordPress meetups, right? So there's something for everything. Now I understand that we're all in quarantine still and that life is still on hold and can't exactly meet up and mingle with people like we used to. Um, But you can still do stuff online. A lot of meetings are taken online through Zoom and other methods. Um, So just because we're in isolation doesn't mean you have to be alone. Meetup.com. Another one is wikidoo.com. I talk to clients about this one a lot. Wikidoo is not necessarily a social event site. What Wikidoo does is it pulls from all over the internet and it lists events in your area. Now you can do it for the day of, you can do it for the weekend, you can do it for the next 30 days. And it'll show you a calendar of events from all over the internet. Some are from meetup.com. Others are just local listings, free concerts, 
you, and it breaks it down by tab. So uh, it could be art, it could be family events, it could be culture, it could be music. I mean, and if you just want to look at art events, you can just single out art events. It's really neat if you're not sure what you want to do or it's a great way to kind of see what's coming up for the month. So you can just have it top of mind if there's if you have time that weekend or that day that you can engage. And I include this because in order to build your support system, you have to get outside your door, or at least in some some fashion, even if it's online. But when this whole corn thing is over and things go back to uh, some new normal, wikidoo.com is a good place to kind of get out and know what's going on around you so that you can, you know, inject yourself into society and then that improves your opportunities to meet new people, but people around similar interests, and that's really important. The fourth thing is social media groups. This one's pretty straightforward. This would be your Facebook groups, etc., um, where you uh, can find support around similar things. Mommy groups, uh, couples groups, you name it. You know, there's a group for everything. Mental health groups um, where you can get peer support online right pretty cool and the fifth thing is for those looking for more professional guidance uh psychologytoday.com has a therapy therapist finder directory so you can find online therapists private therapists um and uh therapists make good uh sounding boards usually for um getting support and figuring things out all right, so I hope you found value in this. If you if you found uh, this this information to be helpful, please do show your support by uh, liking, subscribing, sharing. Um, and to recap, I just want to cover you know recap the five the five main takeaways from this. The first of which is to make room for more active supports. Point number two: map out your social support system. Point number three. Conduct a needs assessment. Point number four, leverage existing supports. And number five, create new supports. Okay, now put it into practice. Uh, go make good things happen. Um, if you need some additional support uh, resources, you can always uh, look at the show notes. I provide uh, a resource guide and I have a page on my site for recommended books um, for your edification. Um, and then uh, also let me know, you know, is this is the the sound on this episode better than it has been? I'm I'm really trying to bootstrap and learn the media side of all of this so I can breed, bring you the best possible content. I have stepped up my game a little bit and this is I went from a, a audio technica microphone for you techies out there to that was a USB XLR combo and now i have stepped it up to an uh, sm58 and i have a preamp cloud lifter and a 2i2 scarlet interface that i'm feeding into the camera uh, a newer uh, canon m50 that i got by recommendation of sean cannell at think media great great uh, youtube channel if you're looking to get into the the youtube scene um and then I have the SM7B coming to step up. That's more of a studio mic. This is more of a stage mic. But hopefully um, I'm providing you better quality with every video that I roll out, better content. Um, please let me know what's helpful. And if there's anything you want me to speak to directly, please do just let me know in the, uh, the comments or the, my contact me form. And I'll be happy to add that to the queue. Um, again, I am a licensed therapist, but I'm not your therapist. If you need a professional, you should get one. Um, otherwise, go make good things happen, and I will catch you in the next episode. You take care now. Bye-bye.